if my life is not where it needs to be in relationship to God, that out of my relationship to God comes my authority, my anointing, my ability to create harvest, my ability to create growth in people. I was 19 years old and I was in Canada. And then I went to general conference and at that particular time at General Conference, the evangelist seminar that they had or the evangelist banquet that they had was that, like the main service of the whole General Conference. Uh, it was the best thing going at that moment. And so I, as an evangelist, went to that meeting and all the great evangelists were there. Anthony Mangan, he was just 20 something years old. Uh, and Mike Williams, uh, there was uh, Richard Hurd, Mike Hayes, uh, Steve Muncy, Steve Fender, and the people that were speaking was Mark Hanby, Kenneth Phillips, Tommy Kraft, Merle Ewing, I mean, the best of the best. Now, I left that meeting. It was a phenomenal meeting. I mean, and everyone was just super nice. It wasn't anything that anybody said or did. But I walked away from that meeting totally discouraged because I knew that I was not in their class. There was no way that I could match their anointing, their giftings, or their talent. They were so far beyond me. And I walked away and I just was honest with God. I said, God, if you don't do something, I'm going to, I'm going to, there's no way I'm going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I can't match that. There's just no way I can do it like Mark Hanby, Kenneth Phillips, and Anthony Mangan, and all of those great people. So what am I going to do? I'm going to starve to death on the evangelistic field. I'm going to have to go back home and get a job. I'm not going to be able to make it. I'm 19. I don't have their talents. Well, I in every crisis moment in my life, I have always done one thing. I have gone to God in prayer and fasting. Because if you really need to hear from the Lord and get direction, prayer and fasting is the only way I know to do it. It's just that simple. You got to push the plate back. And I'm talking about total fast. I'm not talking about a Daniel's fast. I'm not talking about cheating fast. I'm talking about starve your fool self to death fast. That's what I'm talking about. Well, on the fifth day, I went on a five-day fast, and I went to God in prayer. And on the fifth day, I felt the Lord come into the room where I was at in Canada. It was 38 degrees below zero outside. It was cold. I was miserable. My wife was in Alaska with our firstborn baby, and it was just a miserable time. But the Lord visited me in my room and sat down on the edge of the bed with me, and I felt his arm come around me and he spoke into my spirit and said, Brian, if you'll learn to meet me every day, I'll show you how to do this. And I will make of you what I want to, but you got to meet me every day. And so from that point, these principles began to forge in my spirit. I wrote about it and made for more about developing that rule of five, where you, the five things that you do every day to personally grow in your relationship to God could be different for different people, but you need to come up with a disciplined plan of everydayness with God, where you spend that time with him, because he's the only one that can empower us to do his will in the earth without those concepts and principles. And I found that I had been taught a lot of things, not necessarily nothing concerning our doctrine, our message, our holiness, our lifestyle, nothing concerning that. But it, I was taught so many different concepts that were not biblical, that would not allow me to operate in authority and anointing. And when God began to change my concepts and my, my understanding of these principles, then I recognize the word of God is true. I mean, God operates according to his word. 
And if there's anything the apostolic church needs in this hour is the authority and the anointing of God to give us the dominion that we need to overthrow the spirit of despondency that we are fighting that has seemed to settled over everybody. I mean, not just the people of our churches, it's been, it's over the whole world. You can't go anywhere without people feeling that sense of despair. And it's been generated, it's been broadcasted by the media, but I think it's been generated by hell to try to shut down the church and to keep us from becoming what God wants us to be. Well, that's the reason why these seven principles, I believe, are going to be even more powerful and more uh, life-changing and transforming because you have to determine, do I really want to make the changes in my thinking? And then it orders your emotions as well once these concepts get into your spirit. Because what I have found, we generally end up sabotaging ourselves by the wrong emotions allowing our emotions to get away from us, speaking out of our emotion and not out of, our, of the Holy Ghost or the Word of God. And you, we've got to learn how to do this because God is depending on us. God is calling us to this. God is desiring us. He wants to use us in this hour in a greater dimension than he's ever done before. And I, I was struggling with that burning desire to increase the effectiveness of my ministry because I wanted more souls to be saved. I wanted saints to receive greater light and to become true disciples of Jesus Christ. I wanted them to be better equipped to tackle the unique problems of our society. And so God led me to these seven principles in scripture. They've literally revolutionized the results when I preach I went from adding to the church to multiplying the church. I went from being afraid of, of the situation to knowing that God had called me and that God had prepared me. But God is more interested in a prepared vessel than in a prepared message. In God's economy, the most important factor is the condition of my heart, the condition of my spirit. Ministry is a matter of both a renewed spirit and a renewed mind working together to produce God's purpose. And so if you look into the scripture, you find that it's only mentioned once where we are to be renewed in our spirit, Titus 3, 5. But three times in scripture, he tells us to renew our minds and renew the spirit of our minds. And we do that by spending time with God every day in his word, in prayer. And I'll tell you what my rule of five is in just a moment. But I want to share with you my first principle that God opened my understanding to. I mean, it, it just revolutionized my thinking. And that is the consistency of God. From the example of one of David's mighty men, Benea who gained victory over a lion in a pit on a snowy day. He defeated the lion in a pit at his lowest, on a snowy day at his coldest, and discovered that even when he is at his lowest and his coldest, God can still give us the victory. But to do that, we have to learn to master our emotions you know, I've heard people say all throughout my life, when everybody in this church gets unified, we'll have revival. When everybody starts praying, we'll have revival. Well, there's never been a day in my life when I've been in any church where everybody was praying, when everybody was in unity. And if that's the condition, we are losing. We're fighting a losing battle. I pastor 1,600 people and there is no way I'm going to get that bunch on the same page where the Bible teaches us to operate in authority and anointing where two or three are gathered in my name. There will I be in the midst. All I need is one other person on this call to come into agreement with me in the Holy Ghost and the power of God's going to move. I don't care where you're at emotionally. I don't care what's going on in your life. God cannot 
be hindered from operating in his perfect will if I can find one other person to join with me in the name of Jesus and come into agreement. I believe me and Brother Robinette are in agreement in the Holy Ghost. I believe that we're already connected uh, in the Spirit. So I know God's going to move because my faith is not a feeling. It's an acceptance of truth in the face of adverse circumstances, whether I'm on the mountain or in the valley or in a pit on a snowy day, whether I'm an Elijah facing the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, or I'm a David in the valley of Elah facing Goliath, or I'm Benaiah in a pit on a snowy day facing a lion. God has given us the power to operate, and he will give us the power to be equal to the task at hand. So I've learned to create my own atmosphere. Even when I was a kid preacher running around trying to do my best, I could create my own atmosphere when I had the right attitude about everybody else's coldness and everybody else's lack of response. Our motives have to be re-examined in order for us to come into alignment with this. We got to align ourselves with what God values. When you determine that you will no longer preach just to do a good job, but you will minister to help save someone from the destructive jaws of the lion, even when you're having a bad day, don't let your bad mood stop you from operating in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And don't just allow the emotions that you feel at this particular moment, stop you from believing that God is able to deliver. I promise you, if God puts this principle of divine consistency, I am the Lord and I change not. He's declared it in the spirit. It's the foundational statement of God's character that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is always the same. And we can create our own atmosphere. Uh, we can literally clear the air of the negativity. I found out you can clear the air of the negativity just by you deciding in your spirit, the Lord is in this place because I brought him to the house. There's been times when, when, the, when the church was so cold and the church was so dead and it was so negative in its atmosphere that people sat back in the church and marveled at how an anointing could flow in such an atmosphere. And yet I was able to stand up and take authority on the worst day. I can trust God to be at his very best because I, the terrifying foe that faces us in the pit is not really my true enemy. The, the, the Goliath in the valley is not my true enemy. And all of the prophets of Baal is not my true enemy. My true enemy is myself and my own emotions and my own mood swings and my own inability to bring myself into alignment with God's perfect consistency and constancy. That means that God can move right now on, on this online lesson as powerfully as he's ever moved in any general conference, any crusade, any meeting you've ever been in, in your entire life. God not only can move in the same dimension, he can, he can go beyond it <laughs> and he can do more than he's ever done before. I'm not just convinced of that. I know it because I've seen it operate. I've seen God uh, move with such power. Now, here's what Elijah did in order to be able to gain victory on his mountaintop. He first repaired the altar. And that's where your rule of five comes in. You've got to repair your altar. And it's important that you do this. I remember when I was preaching for Brother J.T. Pugh. This is back when I was in my 20s. He was pastoring in Odessa before Brother Terry Pugh took over. I think he was helping his dad at that particular time, but I was preaching revival. 
And back there in those days, we stayed with the preacher uh, and, and or we stayed in a rundown evangelist quarters. <laughs> you missionaries on deputation know exactly what I'm referring to. But we stayed, I stayed with Brother Pugh and, uh, you know, Brother Pugh was uh, an amazing man of God, but he loved his breakfast and he always ate a good breakfast. And sometimes Sister Pugh would get up in the morning and make us those big, fantastic, buttery, flaky biscuits. Brother Pugh didn't believe in margarine. He didn't believe in, in, in that fake stuff. He believed in the real thing. So he had real butter. And he didn't believe in store-bought honey. He got his honey from a hive in the area. And I'm telling you, we would put butter on those biscuits and we would put that honey on those biscuits. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost all over me. <laughs> well, sometimes Sister Pew didn't feel like cooking breakfast. So we had to walk to McDonald's. It was two miles to McDonald's and we had to walk. And so he would teach me while we walked and I would walk with him to McDonald's and he would instruct me and I would just listen. And he asked me a question one day. He said, brother Kinsey, I, I would like to ask you a question. Do you have a plan for personal growth in your life and ministry? And I hesitated for about 15, 10 to 15 seconds, trying to think real quick. He said, that's what I thought. You do not. <laughs> he said, Brother Kinsey, you need to be able to tell me your plan for growth within five seconds, or you do not have one. And so uh, you need to know where you go to, to seek God. You need to have a place you need to have a time. You need to know what you're wanting to accomplish. You need to have books that you're reading. You need to be able to know that every day at this time, barring emergencies and urgent situations, barring any of that, where you go to God in prayer every day and learn from his word. And I learned something from what he taught me. And I developed this rule of five. And this is where I, I saw this consistency of God. This is how God spoke it into my spirit, is that I was in a daily devotion. And he showed me Benaiah's magnificent uh, defeat of the lion in a pit on a snowy day. And I saw that God doesn't care what emotional condition the atmosphere of the church is in. He cares about whether or not I've been walking with him every day. He, we can purify the atmosphere around us when we seek God's kingdom and his righteousness first. Nothing will be impossible to those of us who allow God to bring about this alignment with our, our emotions to the word of God our concepts to the word of God. We need to bring everything into alignment. If Jesus can heal a man on the Sabbath day with everybody angry at him, and he can bring forth one man and cause him to restore his hand on the Sabbath day, I'm going to tell you right now in the midst of COVID, God can still give you revival and God can still give us an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We might be in a seed planting time rather than in a harvest time, but God can still open the door for us to prepare ourselves for the greatest harvest because the greatest harvest is about to happen in the kingdom of God. And that's not just something I'm saying to whistle in the dark. That is what God has taught me in my rule of five every day, I go before the Lord in prayer. Every day I operate in authority. Every day I, I take authority in the Holy Ghost. And I'll share with you in just a moment what my rule of five is. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to make it the same, but you've got to do something. And I, I taught our church this. And when I taught our church how to personally grow in the kingdom, 
without depending on just a church service alone to give you the strength you need to make it in your walk with God. Our church has doubled and we had a large church when I took it, but we have more than doubled this church since I have uh, taught them how to grow. Because when you start growing people's hearts and people's minds to where they've overcome the toxic culture of Pentecost, the jealousy, the anger, the lust, and the rage that people's passions connect to. When you dis determine how to do that, God is able to give you a strong deliverance that will bring about consistency in your life. And that is what you've got to be able to to, to produce in order to sustain your growth. Cause I'm not just interested in teaching you about growing. I want you to sustain it. I want you to start enjoying your times with God more than when you're in the pulpit, more than when you're even uh, with other people. I want you to enjoy those times. I want God to begin to step into your life and, and show you how to bring everything into alignment to his word. I feel the Holy Ghost right now on me in the spirit because I believe that God is going to give you power over your emotions and your fears and, and, and different things that are working against you and keeping you from creating this atmosphere because you don't want to create an atmosphere of fear. And we don't want to create now the fear of the Lord, yes, but not the fear that has torment. And there's a fear that hath torment, the Bible says, and then there's the spirit of the fear of the Lord, where we always constantly want to have the spirit of the fear of the Lord, but never the fear that has torment. I don't want to create an atmosphere of jealousy. I don't want to create an atmosphere of panic and anxiousness. I want to create an atmosphere. It's all right to admit these emotions exist, but I want you to draw such strength from the rock, such strength from your daily devotion and your daily altar that you're, a, you're going to repair. I, I told our people, I said, I want you to go home and I want you to select a place. I want you to tell me where you go. Because if you can't tell me where you go to pray or where you go to read or where you go to, to do your rule of five, you don't have a place and you're not doing it. So forget it. If you can't tell me the time that you try to, and I know all of us have life to live and we've got jobs and we've got different things that we've got to do and, and families that we got to tend to, and that's all understandable. And sometimes that ha you have to be flexible in that. But you need a time where you try to every day go to your place and meet with God. It is vital. I cannot tell you how important it is. When, when COVID hit and they shut us all down, I went online for the first time where I addressed our church on a regular service night with no church because we were shut down. I said, I've taught you your rule of five. I taught you your daily walk. Now you know why I taught you to do this because God's going to work during our shutdown as great as he works in church. And I'm going to prove it to you. We had people come into the church to get baptized. We had testimonies of people getting the Holy Ghost online. I mean, God continued to move with power in the midst of all of this. Now, see, Moses messed up when he smote the rock the second time. And, and here's what I want to share with you because it's so vitally important. And this is what Brother Billy Cole taught me. I used to pick him up early in the morning and take him to the young minister's class at Louisiana camp meeting when I was the uh, brother Tenney put me in charge of that. So I had to take care of the speaker and he would teach us while we were riding in the cart together. He would teach us during the class. And he said something to me, brother. He said, brother Kinsey, I want to share something with you that I think will change your life forever. He said, I learned long ago 
that whatever I want to see in the ministry, not everybody's going to approve of it or like it. So I want to, I wanted to, at very young age, I wanted to see over 3,000, yea, 5,000 people to get, receive the Holy Ghost in a single service. As a matter of fact, I hungered for it. And I kept saying it. I kept saying it even when people mocked me and even people made fun of me, maligned my character. I kept saying it until I got to see it. And then I kept speaking it until I saw what I was speaking. And that's exactly what God is teaching us to do. Quit smiting the rock with your out of control emotions and start speaking to it and say what you want to see until you see what you say. <laughs> say what you want to see until you see what you say. And I learned that from Brother Billy Cole. And I promise you that if you will keep saying it, it creates consistency because you don't change messages when you change moods. You don't change, you don't change words when you change emotions because everybody has mood swings and everybody gets down and discouraged, but I don't speak out of that. I've learned to go to my place. I've learned to stand before God and I've learned to speak what I want to see. I want to see revival in your churches, in your place of ministry, wherever and whatever you're able to do. God is still at work behind the scenes. And I promise you that consistency is the very, the very disciplined, constant, daily relationship with Jesus Christ that you need to receive. The second principle that God taught me, oh, this was a tough one for me. I'm going to tell you because I've had trouble with this one. The constancy of God seemed to make sense to me. The consistency one it was an easier principle for me to adapt to because I saw the value of it immediately and it just seemed to click in my mind and I was able to step up to it and create my own atmosphere by by developing my rule of five and getting my daily walk with God so that God could show me how to operate in authority and anointing. But this second one was my battle. I guess everybody's going to struggle with one of them. Well, I struggled with number two. And the second one was what Brother Barnes taught me. I, I, I had been an evangelist for 20 years. Uh, and I wanted more. I wanted to see God work more in my ministry than he'd ever done before. Uh, I, I wanted to increase. I wanted to grow exponentially. I wanted multiplication. I, I was tired of addition. I mean, I'd get four or five people prayed through, but I wanted 100, 200, 500, 1,000. Come on, God, let's do this thing. And so I went to Brother Barnes. I, I, I don't know if y'all know Brother T.W. Barnes. He pastored in Minden for 800 years, and I've preached for him several times, and he was a, a mighty man of God. And I, I just set an appointment with him to go see him. And when I walked in the door of his little office, rectangular office, I walked in the door, he stood up, he didn't shake my hand. He didn't say, Brother Kenzie, how you doing? Great to see you. I love you. He didn't say any of that. He just pointed his bony finger right in my face and said, Brian, you don't enjoy the battle anymore. He said, you got to make up in your mind every morning when you wake up, you'll have to unsheathe your sword and prepare yourself for war for Satan's never going to give up. He will never cease to try and take you down. And if you make it to heaven and walk through those pearly gates, listen carefully as they close behind you, because you will hear the rat-a-tat-tat of the arrows as he makes his last ditch effort to stop you from realizing God's perfect will. He said, but you remember this, 
For every new level of power you achieve, you face a new set of devils more sophisticated than the last. But you also remember that the same thing that defeated him before will defeat him again and again and again. The same name, the same blood, the same word works over and over again. Wow, you have to enjoy the battle. And this is what God showed me in one of my devotions. When Samson encountered the lion on his way to Timnath, notice the scripture specifically states that he did not discuss his conflict with his mother or father who went with him on the journey. He had turned aside to get some grapes in a vineyard so they could eat and feast on the journey. He did not tell them about his conflict. And I've learned there's some battles you got to learn how to fight in secret. And I've learned to quit talking about the battle and learn to do what Samson did and extract honey from the carcass of that lion and share that honey with everybody I want to meet. Do I want to cry about my problem? Sure. But you got to quit crying about your problem. And you got to start sharing the honey. I want to know, did you get any sweetness out of it? You don't have to reveal every battle with the lion. Just remember to carry plenty of honey with you wherever you go. Celebrate the small victories. And this is how I've learned to enjoy the battle. I've learned to celebrate small victories. I've learned, as a matter of fact, Brother Robinette, I've learned to celebrate other people's victories because I can't experience all of them myself. Sometimes I'm going through a tough time, but I found that if I can find somebody else who is anointed and got a testimony and a victory that they're wanting to share, my, my best opportunity to overcome is going to be when I step into their joy and I rejoice with them in what God's doing in their life. What would happen in, oh, ha. What would happen in Pentecost right now if our jealous spirit of our brother's anointing would leave us and we could start celebrating what God's doing for somebody else? I feel like shouting on my own message right now. It is a lesson to be learned, the principle of joy in the battle. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. If God has promised us that kind of strength, <laughs> that kind of emotional stability, I choose joy and not self-pity. I choose praise and not pitifulness. I choose power rather than the problem. I'm not going to just look at, do we have problems? I've got more problems than I know what to do with, but I still believe in possibilities. I still believe we can defeat the devil. The same name, the same blood, the same word works over and over again. It'll work on the devil at the low level. It'll work on the devil at the new level. It'll work on the devil at any level. It still works. It worked for Jesus. It works for Brother Robinette. It works for Sister Bateman. It works for Brother uh, Grata. It works for me. It works for Nathan. It works for Carl. It works for every single person on call. This works. It'll work for you, but you've got to start enjoying the battle. We get to where we want to enjoy the victory but we want to whine during the battle and we want to talk about how tough it is. And it is, I'm telling you the emotional effect. It's so serious. One of our preacher's wives ended her life. She had COVID, but she overcame COVID, but the depression that came on her as a result overwhelmed her and she took her own life. I have never seen an assault on the ministry like I have seen through the COVID deal. 
Many of our preachers have died that I would have never anticipated or expected something of this nature would take them out. And yet it has taken them out. And I'm not, and I know that I'm not, I don't want to be insensitive to that. But we're in a battle like we've never been in before. And yes, we can find joy in the midst of this battle because we don't serve God for the temporal and we don't serve God for the temporary. We serve the Lord for the eternal. And if we cannot gain sight of the eternal, you can't get joy in the battle. It's impossible if you do not have eternity in your heart. And I found going to church is a wonderful thing, going to conferences, I love them all. I enjoy it, I enjoy meeting all of you I love it. I want to do more of it. I just enjoy it. But I've found that you can't get what you need from God at those places only. You've got to have that daily walk. You've got to walk with God every day. You got to take that comfort in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, how do you have uh, victory and joy in the midst of the battle? So here's what I do. And this is, this has worked for me. It may not work for you, but this is what I do. I do not dwell on my problems. I dwell on my possibilities. I don't look back and memorialize my, my victories of yesterday. I look forward to ex, ex, with expectation of what God's going to do. Expectation is greater than experience. Say, well, I want an experience with God. Yes, God wants to, you to have an experience with him, but that experience has to give way to expectation. If expectation does not become the main rule of our spirit, it's going to be very difficult for you to have joy in the battle, I can tell you right now because you're always going to be looking backwards at what you used to have, what you saw, what you felt, and that's not going to sustain you in the battle. But what will sustain you is the expectation of what God's going to do. And you got to speak to that expectation. You can't just have it in your mind. You got to speak it. Here's the three rules of learning that I incorporate into my rule of five. And so I'm going to start sharing some of my rule of five with you. The first is, is you must read. You must write is the second. And you must speak the best way. Everybody says, how do I need, how do I learn the word of God? What do I do to study? I said, teach a Bible study. <laughs> Teaching a Bible study is the best way for you to learn the word of God. Did you got to study to teach it? And, and, and to create your lessons and to create a disciplined manner of, of studying, to, to speak your lesson. If you do not write what you read within 24 to 48 hours, you will lose it. If you do not speak it or teach it to someone, you will lose it within 72 hours. So you got to read it, you got to write it, and you got to speak it. So I, I, my rule of five, first of all, in order for me not to dwell on my problems, and then the next thing that I do to create joy in the battle is I do not let other people discourage me. Listen, you can't allow the roaring lions of peer pressure, cliques, misconceptions, intellectualism, and poor theology, just to name a few, keep you from experiencing the sweet fruit of God's full salvation. Don't allow others to pressure or subtly intimidate you from seeking all that God has for you. I rebuke that off of you in Jesus' name. But here's how I've been able to do this. What I do is every day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my word and I'm going to read it. And then I have my scriptures that I pray over myself and over my church and over the kingdom of God. I don't just pray my supplication or my list, my Santa Claus list, and there's nothing wrong with having one, but I don't just pray my list. I pray the word over myself. 
Some of you may pray through the tabernacle like Brother Anthony taught us, Brother Anthony Mangan taught us. I've done that uh, and it's worked very powerfully in my life. It's helped me overcome the negative thinking that I as, am surrounded by. You got to learn to respond to criticism with a smile. And the only way I know to do this is to speak word on my life. Man, the word of God's powerful. You mean you actually pray the word? I actually take Psalms 23. I actually take Psalm 119. I, I pray Ephesians chapter one, two, and three. I pray it. I pray it all up in my life. I pray it on my wife. I pray it on my children. You got to pray the word because, you know, I may be asking something from God that's not his will and it's all right if he doesn't choose to give it to me. I, I allow God to say no and I don't, you know, get bent out of shape over it. I, I let him say no because he knows what he's doing. But when you pray the word, that's the will of God. I mean, it's never not the will of God for me to pray the word. And I, I, I take all those negative thoughts and I speak word to it. I don't try to come against it with a new experience or some new deal. I just take the word. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, devil. You hear me? I can go through COVID. I can go through the negativity. I can go through everything and overcome it in Jesus Christ. I speak the word, have faith in God. Speak to the mountain to be removed and it shall be done. And I've learned to store up joy. Put some honey in a jar and carry it with you. Because he didn't just eat the honey himself, he shared it. And when you can learn to share, teach it, say it, get you a faith buddy. You can't share every, with everybody because they'll tear you up. Because if they're going through a tough time and you have to be wise because if they're uh, embittered by something or they've lost their victory or their joy, it's going to be very difficult for you to communicate what I'm saying now. You're going to have to do a different thing for them. And we can discuss that later on. But uh, I want you to get this rule of five. Pray that word over yourself. That joy keeps you uh, fresh. It keeps you fresh in the Holy Ghost. And, and it seals you against the negative thinking. It'll help you choose your friends a little more wisely and your associates a little more wisely. So I want you to store up joy and I want you to have joy in the midst of the battle. And here's what I found out. Bitterness should never be the result of the battle. Betterness should be the result of the battle. Not bitterness, betterness. Yes, I don't like the battle any more than you do. But if I'm getting better, I got something to rejoice about. If I'm learning stuff, maybe I failed. Maybe I didn't do it just right. Maybe I, you know, wanted to slap Brother Robinette uh, and, and knock him upside his head instead of love on him and bless him. <laughs> well, that's all right because I'm, I'm learning about myself and I don't have to allow my failures to defeat me. Because I promise you this roaring lion only has a bark and he cannot take you down. Now he can choke the life out of you. He still has power to speak into your life and get you to believe his nonsense. But I refuse to do it. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now that's just my first rule of five and I do it every day and, and I speak that word and I pray that word and I declare that word because I decree it. I declare what I want to see happen. I decree it in the Holy ghost. I don't just, Oh God, please give me revival and help me not to slap brother Robinette and Oh God, you know, and all of this whining prayer. God is so sick of us whining while we pray. 
If you want something from God, declare it. Say, well, how do I know if it's the will of God? If it's the word of God, it's the will of God. If like, just take this scripture, one shall put a thousand to flight and two shall put 10,000 to flight. God, I come into agreement. That's my third principle. And I'm not going to have time to get into that because that's another part of my rule of five. And I'm, I'm trying to hurry here. How much more time do I have, Brother Robinette? It's 1252, my time, 752 your time, I believe. You have five minutes, uh, sir, and then I'll open it up for a question and answer. I'm also going to ask you to pray over everybody. So at some point, we'll have prayer for a moment, and then I'll open it for questions and answers with everybody. I, I love it. I love it. Now, now here's one, one thing I had to learn. And, and this is the reason why God was able to open the door. I could preach in the Canadian church. I could preach in an American church. I could preach in any church anywhere, rural, city, slow, fast, big, small, didn't make any difference. I could have revival anywhere I put my foot on that territory and claim it for Christ. And here's the reason Here's the thinking that had to change in me because I was taught it all my life that you have to have a majority because that's the democratic process. We were trained to think that way. You gotta have a majority to get elected. You gotta have a majority to have revival. And that is not true. It's not biblical and it's not true. You just, you have to have two agree touching any one thing and God will do it. The reason Jesus said, uh, oh, this, this, this is powerful. The reason why you have to do two is the rabbis taught, they taught this centuries before Jesus was born, that in order to create Shekinah, in order for there to be a manifestation of the Shekinah glory, you had to have a speaker of the word and you had to have an agreer to the word, an amener. You had to have a yes and then you had to have an amen. Somebody has to declare and somebody has to affirm. It was said among the rabbis that the one who says amen is greater than than the one who speaks the blessing because he completes the circuit for the Shekinah glory of God to be made manifest in our midst. I learned that I can have revival if I come into agreement with one person. All I need is one more. Do you want to break the back of this terrible force that is fighting us right now. Then all I need is one of you to agree. Now the rest of you might be going through it. You might be struggling with some of the things I struggle with that, that joy in the battle. I'm going to tell you, I fight it and I still fight it because I get tired in the battle. I want the victory. I don't, I don't want the battle. God, give me a victory somewhere. Just one victory. I'll take one. I'll take a half of one. Uh, and, and I'm tired of the battle. And then the Lord has to rebuke me. And I get rebuked. My wife will remind me, you got to have joy in the battle. And, and you, it, it's a part, it's a part of the process. Uh, and I found as an evangelist, I could, you know, I had evangelists tell me, I don't like to preach in Canada. I love to preach in Canada. And then I've had evangelists say, I don't like to preach up North, man. Give me a North church. I'll preach because all I need is one person. If I can find one single person to come into agreement, I will tear the devil's stronghold down. All I need is one person and it doesn't make any difference who it is. As long as you connect in agreement over what is the will of God and what is the word of God, then 
God's going to flow according to his word. He's not going to flow according to my emotions. He's not going to flow according to my will. He's not going to flow. That's the difference between the supernatural and magic. A magician wants to force his will on the natural world and, and form the natural world around his will. Supernatural wants to bring God into the picture and bring God's will into force and not my will. That's why praying not my will, but thine be done is more important than anything you will ever pray in your life. Not my will, but thine be done. And so God is looking to us to create this agreement. And that's why we need to get all the jealousy. How are you going to be in agreement with somebody you're jealous of? How are you going to be in agreement with somebody you're envious of? How are you going to fight people and not and be in agreement with them? You can't fight and be in agreement at the same time. You got to find out, do you want to curse them or you want to bless them? And you got to determine which one you want to do. So, I pray the word, I pray it every day. I read it and I pray it. I speak it, I read it. And of course, uh, that's where I start. And then I, we'll, we'll talk more about that. And, and I wanted to uh, turn this back to Brother Robinette. Uh, I think my five minutes is up. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Brother Kenzie. I think before we go to a question and answer, I'd really like to ask you to just pray over all of us and speak the word over all of us, and then we'll give our team a chance to, to weigh in and ask questions of you, sir. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity to be able to speak your magnificent word into the hearts of these precious people. And I know that we are hurting over the circumstances that we're currently in. But I also know, God, that what you have shown me and taught me in my daily devotion and what I have put into action here in Pensacola to bring about a doubling of our congregation in the midst of every kind of crisis you can think of, we come through every one of those crises because we have experienced joy in the battle. I speak joy into the hearts of these people, not just in a victory that's been won, but in the battle and in the struggle. I speak consistency and constancy of my God's hand upon their life. I feel the hand of God upon these people. I feel the anointing of your spirit in their life. I feel their hunger and desire to bring your will into this world and have your power operate to make that will a reality. God, I say, break the back of this enemy. I speak dominion. I speak abundance. I speak multiplication upon the people of God right now in the name of Jesus. Receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Wow, this has been an incredible session with Pastor Kinsey. I want to just remind everybody for the next two Monday nights at 7 p.m., Next Monday, we're going to have this session with Pastor Kinsey again with French translation. And then the week after that, we will have the session again with Pastor Kinsey uh, with a Spanish translation. And I'm going to be working with Pastor Sayers tonight. We have a, a conversation directly following this meeting. Um, and he's very passionate about trying to facilitate all four languages, French, Spanish, German, and Romanian, on every Monday night. And he's trying to um, uh, pull me out of the dark ages. I think he has the spirit that brother Kinsey has where he wants to smack me. And so, um, we're going to, we're going to help him to get over that spirit tonight by me yielding to his desire. I'm going to agree <laughs> with pastor Sayers tonight <laughs> to avoid getting smacked around. So, um, we're going to open this up for a season of, uh, for a few moments of questions and answers. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, it would be better if we're not all shouting out. If you could just type in the chat, hey, I've got a question. Um, I can call you by name and, and facilitate um, uh, your question much easier. So if you have a question, anybody have a question, please, please let me know in the chat. Okay.
appreciate everybody. Uh, Sister Hackenbrook, thank you so much. Our missionary to Switzerland, who's residing in Germany right now and being a great work to the uh, a great blessing to the work of the Lord in Germany and the German-speaking nation. Sister Hackenberg, go ahead with your question. Well, sir, thank you so much for all you had to say tonight. Um, I took so many notes, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss any of the rule of five. Could you just list them out for me quickly? I only gave you the first one. Okay, I thought that was <laughs> I only gave you rule number one. If you got one, you got the only one I gave you. We got it. We got it. I'm good. <laughs> I can give you all five of them, though, right now, if you want them. I, uh, I can do it real know. quickly. It's it's up to, uh, I can do it real quickly. The second thing I do is write in a journal or in my notes or on my computer, I write. That's how I've written six books. I write every day. I write something every day. I don't sit down and do the crash crunch thing. I do the everyday thing. It's amazing at how many books you can read and how many books you can write just doing something every day. And I don't have to do it long, 30, 45 minutes, but you do it every day. I mean, if you write a page a day, that's 365 pages a year. <laughs> All you got to do is write one page a day. And it's just the everydayness of it that makes it manageable for me because I got too much going on. Mm -hmm. The third thing that I do is I speak into a leader's life, either someone who is ahead of me, someone who is alongside me, or someone who is following me. I speak into a leader's life, a word of encouragement, a word of admonition, challenge them, speak into their life. I find a leader every single day to talk to and to encourage. And I, I try to get my encouraging voice into their life because everybody in this, on these, on this call, I don't care who you are, you need encouragement. Everybody here needs encouragement. And, and I, I want to be the, you know, I, I used to go to conference and whine because nobody encouraged me. And then God rebuked me and said, did you encourage anybody? I said, well, I whine. I, I'm a whiner. I'm not an encourager. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I realized it, I, I, I received the rebuke. And now I don't, I don't go to conference to get encouraged. I go to encourage somebody. And, and then people will stop me and say, you're always encouraging. Why are you always encouraging? You make me sick. You're always a positive. That's because I, I've already gotten over my desire to slap Brother Robinette. And God has dealt with me in my rule of five, and I've repented of my sin. <laughs> so I, I, I found out that it's better to encourage than to get encouraged. I become encouraged when I encourage, because I'm fulfilling my ministry. That's my ministry. And I really don't want to slap you, Brother Robinette. I love you. <laughs> I, I want you to know that. Now, Sister Robinette has paid me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I needed to make some money. I'm in a remodeling project and I need to pay it <laughs> off. And she, she hel is helping the cause. No, I'm teasing. The, th uh, the fourth thing that I do is real easy. I, I, I read, I pray first thing, read, pray. Second thing I write, third thing I speak to a leader and I speak to a hurting saint or a hurting soul every day, the word of God. I speak to a hurting saint or to a hurting soul, a sinner. I try to do both. Of course, in my line of work, with as many people as we've got uh, at our church, that's not, I mean, that's a given. I'm, I'm going to do that every day. I've already done all those two today. I mean, already today, even before this call, I had to call, I called a leader, a leader called me and I encouraged him uh, and they just called out of the blue. And I've called several leaders spoken into their life already. So most of the time it's multiple. It's not just one, but I, I have not yet spoken to a sinner 
And so I, I have to, unless some of them saints may not be, they may be more <laughs> ain'ts than they are saints, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, but anyway, I will find me a center before it's over with. And then the fifth thing that I do is I reflect because you can lie to yourself and deny real easily as to whether or not you've done all five or all four in this case. I reflect and then I set up the next day. What am I going to do? Okay, what time am I going to be able to, to do this? Of course, generally mine's in the morning, so it's easy to do because I'm always awake. The older I get, the more awake I am. <laughs> so when I was a teenager, I slept all the time. And now that I'm old, I, I, I don't want to sleep. I want to and I can't. <laughs> so I just have to get up and talk to Jesus. So, oh, man, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We've got uh, another question here. Um, and before I ask that question, I just I think that if you have a pen and paper, you need to write this this very important point down that Brother Kenzie just made. That point was that it is a sin to smack Brother Robinette. He had to repent of that. So please <laughs> write that down and remember that. <laughs> okay. The next question that we, um, we have here that came in from Sister Mansfield, we sure love her very much. Um, how do you keep from feeling overcome and hiding from the battle? Woo! I have fought that all my life because, uh, and that's a good way of saying it, Sister Nancy, because I, uh, the feeling overcome uh, just from the busyness of the day can be overwhelming just by itself. But hiding, I, I want to hide when the battle comes. I, I'm, I, you know, David ran to Goliath. I, I want to run and and hide because I, I get tired. I get tired of fighting. And the only way I have been able to adjust myself emotionally to that battle is that I, 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 I've always remembered I need to be with Jesus every single day to hear his voice in my life. Because invariably, if God speaks that voice, he's going to tell me something that will help me engage the enemy and be successful in that battle against him. Now, if you read and write, but you don't hear his voice, you haven't spent enough quality time with him. And you need to go back until you hear his voice. The other day, I was really struggling with the very same thing that we're talking about. Because like I told you, that's, that's I can come into agreement with Brother Robinette uh, and, and have revival here and pray 5 million people through to the Holy Ghost in just no time. I have no problem with the agreement or the constancy of God that just doesn't even seem to phase me. But number two, I mean, I've struggled with it all my life. So I, I'll, I'll just keep on, you know, I have to keep on fighting it. But what I've learned, I, I was sitting on the bed the other day and the Lord came and sat next to me again. I had done my rule of five. I had felt the power of God. I'd felt the moving of the spirit but I hadn't heard the voice and I was just repenting over wanting to no joy in the battle. I was repenting over it. And the Lord just walked in the room. It was in a hotel room and sat down with me right next to me, put his arm around me and said, accept my forgiveness and let me direct your steps. And when God said that to me, that voice, I, I, I whooped every devil. There was no devil that I couldn't fight because I was fighting a battle right then. And I walked into that pulpit. I was preaching a conference. That despondency that I talked to you about is just was so prevalent. 
because it was just hanging over the people. But God gave me victory. <laughs> Glory to God. And he gave me uh, authority to speak into their lives, the very principles that I'm sharing with you. Here, this is so key. And I'm glad you asked that question because that's a point I did not make earlier. You need to get that voice speaking in your life. And here's why, because it's not going to be a loud voice. You will miss it. You hear me? It's a still small voice and you can miss it at the drop of a hat. It can speak and you overlook it because it's so soft, but you need to tune your ear to that voice. And here, I, I don't have any trouble God speaking to me anymore. I only have trouble obeying it. <laughs> I have trouble bringing everything into alignment with it. I, it's not the obedience aspect. It's the emotional component. Bringing myself into the emotional alignment where I bring my feelings online and I say, I'm not giving in to this negativity. Amen. Not giving in to this negativity. So you got to have that voice, but he speaks every day. There's a proceeding word. The Bible says uh, that every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, meaning that it's a continual voice that speaks. So it's not, God's not speaking. So well, I haven't heard from God. That's because you're not tuned in and you got to do this every day. Cause if you're not doing it every day, you, he's not going to talk to you once every two months. You know, I mean, if, he, if you only speak to your wife once every six months, you're going to have problems in your marriage, <laughs> you know? And if you're the one that's only doing the talking and the praying and he's not speaking back to you, you're in trouble because you don't have the strength. You don't have the power to, to do what I'm saying, especially number two. You don't have this joy in the battle. You got to have joy in the battle. Amen, and, amen. And, and, and it's key. It's key to the consistency. It's key to the agreement. It's key. Joy in the battle, not in the victory, in the battle. Amen. Do we have any other questions today? Any other questions? Just let me know here in the chat or wave your hand or something, and I can see that you have a question. Okay. All right. What a wonderful, uh, just an incredible session today. Thank you, Pastor Kinsey. This was uh, just so edifying. We've got so many people on Facebook that are watching live and they've just been uh, chatting like crazy, talking about how amazing it is, ministry changing. And so thank you very much. This has made such an impact, not just in the people that are live on this Zoom session, but on Facebook as well. And so um, we're very thankful for all of you ministers and pastors that are present with us. Um, I see my friend, Pastor Isaac from Hanover here, and um, I sure love you, Pastor Isaac. I thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you, Pastor Isaac, to close out this session in prayer, if you don't mind doing that for us. If you're in a place that you can, just unmute yourself, and we'll close out in prayer. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, Bishop. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for such a blessing teaching. We thank you for the life of our dear pastor who led us in this teaching. We pray in the name of Jesus that whatever that we heard today, God, Yes. Let us you not hear us only, but do us of your word. In the name of Jesus, continue to abide with us as we get closer and closer to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have prayed with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Isaac. Let me just remind everybody, next Monday night, 7 o'clock, Berlin time, uh, we'll be getting back together here with Pastor Kenzie. This is such valuable teaching and instruction and mentoring. Let's spread the word. If there's people you know that this would be a blessing to, let's get everybody on this call next week. And uh, don't forget, next week we'll have French translations. So uh, let's, let's reach out to all of our, 
our, our community. I'll talk to Brother Sayers tonight about whether we can uh, get more languages involved next week. And if we can, you guys know I'll be sending out a weekly email um, and I'll notify you if we can get all five languages, all four languages plus English five um, on the call next week. Okay. Love you all very much. My goodness. So, so good to see you all. Love you, Brother Kenzie. Thank you, Love sir. You too, Brother you. Sister Robinette. I bless you and all of you. In bless Jesus you. name, I bless you. Sister Amber, could you uh, stay online with us briefly? Oh, that's great. We can stay on here. Everybody else hang up. This is a private call. <laughs> <laughs> Love you all. God bless you. Let me just stop this recording, Brother Sayers, before you start calling my names. Hold on. Let's see, stop recording. There we go. Now we're still live on Facebook, so let me figure out how to not do that. Stop